Welcome back to the School of Bustle. We have a great episode today. We have Dr. Peter Fitchin. Dr. Peter Fitchin has a PhD in nutritional sciences. He's a natural pro bodybuilder. He's an online coach of various very competitive bodybuilders. He's a published author in various scientific articles. And what you'll find out in this episode is that he's actually written a book and he's got that coming out later this spring. And in this podcast, we discuss, you know, dieting strategies, body fat settling point, how to know when you're at a good livable body weight, why people feel so crappy when they diet and various things like that. So without further ado, Dr. Peter Fitchin. All right, Peter. So first off, thank you very much for coming on here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So the first thing that I'd kind of like to talk about is, you know, what what kind of strategies do you put in place to kind of make sure a dieting phase is more successful? Like things like using periodic diet breaks, refeeds, things like that. What what kind of big things do you have in place to try to make this phase as successful as possible? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, you know, if, if we're talking diet phase, if we're talking from a contest prep perspective, um, is even if we're not time, you know, giving yourself time. Um, you know, if, if someone wants to diet for a show and, you know, say they're trying to lose a pound a week and they give themselves 20 weeks to lose 20 pounds, in theory, that's probably pretty good. But you realize, that, you know, as you do this more and more, you realize things come up, things happen. There are weeks where you don't lose that one pound. Um, there are weeks where maybe you need a little more flexibility with life. Like maybe, you know, I have a couple of clients, for example, who started prep for spring shows early so that they could get part of the way there and we can diet break for a few weeks over the holidays. Um, you know what I mean? And, and then they hop back on. And as long as they keep things in check with the higher numbers over the holidays, totally fine. You know, weight will be about the same. We can pick back up. Um, but, you know, you know, like I said, things may come up in life. There's going to be weeks you may not, you know, see loss. And so you don't want the first sign of falling behind to be, uh, you know, hey, I'm, I'm all of a sudden behind and now I need to pick up rate of loss. And, you know, all that ends up doing is you pushing harder and harder and harder and having to diet faster and faster and faster. And so a lot of times, you know, that guy who's, you know, trying to diet off 20 pounds in 20 weeks, maybe by the end, it gets to the point where, oh, now I got to lose I don't know, eight pounds in the last four weeks. So now you're dieting at two pounds a week. So now you're dieting faster when you're leaner and more susceptible for muscle loss. And so, you know, if you're going to diet harder, really, it's the other way around. You should be a little more aggressive at the beginning, you know, be, when you're less susceptible to muscle loss. Um, you know what I mean? Because you can get away with a little bit more. But yeah, I mean, I think those would be big things is our, you know, I think the biggest thing is just time, you know, give, allowing yourself time to, you know, implement things and, and roll with the punches when life comes up. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. I've had clients have deaths in the family, you know, a couple weeks out from, you know, a sh or during prep, you know, a few weeks out from a show. I've had clients where, you know, they travel for work a bunch the final weeks before shows. Um, just having a little more, you know what I mean? Just having more time and, and even better yet, being more flexible in, in your end date and your show selection if you can. Um, where you, all right, I'm, I'm within a few pounds. I'll pick a show and, and do it, do it that way. Focus on you making sure you're ready and then picking the show. Um, that also can be really, really beneficial. And even for someone not competing, um, just not rushing, giving yourself time, you know, so that you can kind of let things happen as they happen and roll with the punches in life a bit more because, you know, life's not going to stop when you're dieting. For sure. Yeah. And do you kind of use, it, it kind of sounds like you kind of use diet breaks more so as to be more flexible with someone's life around that rather than setting them up, like structuring them right. You have to do it right here when yeah, you start I, a diet. I usually don't set them up. You have to do this, 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 you know, I, um, you know, I'll implement them. So like, for example, if someone has a longer prep and we get to, a, it, you know, I, I just actually had someone a couple weeks ago. So she, um, she started prep for spring, had, had a decent amount to lose. Every, you know, and we talked about, oh, we're going to, you know, you have a, it's going to be a longer prep. We're going to implement some diet breaks. And she reached, you know, one of her emails, you know, she said, hey, are we still going to diet break? And I'm like, well, everything's still rolling along really well right now. Your food's high. You're losing really on the higher end, even of what we're shooting for. And we're not pushing that hard yet. So mm -hmm. we're not going to take one yet. But, you know, when you hit a plateau, you know, especially if you hit a plateau and we make some adjustments and you don't see a you know, whole lot more loss then yeah, we're, we're definitely going to take one. Um, but you know, while things are going smoothly, I, I don't want to, you know what I mean? I don't want to 
you know, you yeah. don't need to fix what's not broken. You know, if, uh-huh. if things are rolling around really, really well, I'd rather just keep rolling with it until, yeah, then you hit a plateau, then you can have the you know, decision. All right, well, how much have I lost since my last diet break? You know, how long have we gone between adjustments? How am I feeling at this point? You know what I mean? And, and you can yeah. throw one in at that point. But yeah, I, I don't like structured diet breaks, but I also don't structure, I mean, for that matter, I don't structure when deloads happen with clients either. We kind of base that on feel and progression, you know, how they're yeah. feeling and how they're progressing also. Um, it's usually I write a few weeks, we see how it goes. Maybe we add a couple more, maybe we deload before that. I, I don't know. You know what I mean? It depends mm-hmm. on. Um, so yeah, I, I'm very, nothing is set in stone when I'm coaching clients. It's very, you know, let's try this. Let's see how it goes. And you know what I mean? And, yeah. and just accordingly. So you kind of let that momentum carry if it's, if it's, if the ball's rolling, you kind of just let that ride. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, if, if someone lost for, you know, was losing a pound, pound and a half a week for 14 weeks or something, great. Keep, you know, <laughs> you yeah. know, even if it's someone where we were planning to take a diet break, we would just keep going. Once they had a plateau, then yeah, maybe that's the time we diet break. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I, I, I would, if the ball's rolling, yeah, like you said, if the ball's rolling there, I don't see a reason to really stop, you know, and until yeah. when you hit a plateau. Yeah, absolutely. Then we, we talk about, okay, well, you know, maybe we diet break and then try it, you know, see if that helps. And oftentimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but you know, at least at the very least, whether or not it physiologically helps psychologically, it gives you a break. Um, the only thing I would say with a diet break is the only time I wouldn't recommend using it is if someone is getting close to stage lean, um, you don't want to prolong that, um, you know, how long someone yeah. is that lean. Um, you know, we all have that point where we start feeling like absolute garbage and we're, we're kind of below what's actually sustainable. I mean, for me, it's, mm-hmm. you know, I start getting within 10, 15, a stage weight and, and, you know, things don't feel great. And so, um, and, you know, and that's stride to glute stage lean. So, I mean, 10, 15 of that is still pretty lean, you know, it, you know, it compared to general public. And yeah. so, um, and so, from that point on in, I'm not taking a diet break, you know? Mm-hmm. So a lot of times with clients too, if we're going to diet break, you know, in those final stages, we kind of, a lot of times if it's someone who's competed before, they kind of know about where that point is for them. And mm-hmm. so we kind of diet break like right above that. And okay. then that way, you know what I mean? It's kind of like the one yeah. last break, you know, just mentally, physically, you know, break before we you know, drop into the, you know, unsustainable, you know, final mm-hmm. push. Yeah, I've heard, you know, I've heard some people say that the leaner you get, the more diet breaks you should take. And then I've also heard the argument that once you get to that that point, like 10% body fat, it's almost like you're about to go underwater. You want to take that one yeah. final breath and then you just want to get in and that's, get out with no that's diet how I, That's how I tend to think of it because I, I really have a hard time rationalizing, prolonging being in a place that's you know, not sustainable. I mean, late in prep, I mean, I remember the last probably month of my last prep, I would go into the gym and like, you know, you know, progressive overload, you get a little bit stronger, you try to get an extra rep or two each week. I could probably do that. You know, I was doing that pretty much in reverse, you know, <laughs> losing those last four or five pounds, yeah. you know, like getting to those, you know, like, you know, elite level of conditioning. Like it, it, I, I am not someone who holds strength well when I get that lean. Like I can push all I want to push. I can position refeed days. I can position carbs. I can work out different times. You know, it, it just doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Yep. I, um, you know, I dieted slowly. Like it's just those last few pounds. I, I do not hold strength. And a lot of guys don't. Um, you know, you, you think about physiologically what's going on. I mean, how low testosterone is and how many other hormones are, are not normal. Um, the fact that sleep usually isn't very good for most guys who are extremely lean. Um, you know, I, I could wake up at four or 5 AM without an alarm at the end of prep. Didn't matter when I went to bed, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and now, now I need an alarm. I mean, I still get up early, but I, it's I need an alarm to do it mm-hmm. now. <laughs> yeah. And for the most part, do you keep calories pretty, pretty linear throughout like your training weeks and stuff like that throughout a diet? Or do you kind of fluctuate calories from training and off days or what do you do there? Yeah, I, I don't do a whole lot between training and off days, but usually some sort of 
some sort of high day throughout the week or multiple high days or, um, you know, I, my last prep, I had one high day throughout the week. Um, you know, some of my clients who have pretty quick metabolisms, who have the calories to spare yet, yeah, you know, we'll do back to back refeeds, you know, five low too high. Cause there is some early evidence there might be added benefit to doing more than one refeed in a row. Um, problem there is though, for example, you know, someone who has a very low intake, um, you know, so someone who maybe really has to push to get lean, um, you know, back to back refeeds might not be a practical thing. You know, if, if you're a guy who, you know, needs to average 1800 calories a day, um, you know, doing two refeeds up to like 22 or 2400 a day is going to drop those other five days. You know, you're, I don't, I haven't done the math, but I would guess like 15, 1600, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it would be really low. And so at some point that's going to be so low, it's going to, you know what I mean? Negatively affect your performance. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, someone with a quicker metabolism has more calories to spare. You know what I mean? You, you can get away with more refeeds also, or because at some point, you know, you're having more refeeds is going to drop your other days so far that it, unless it's an off day from the gym, I guess, you know what I mean? Like it, mm -hmm. it's going to be pretty low performance training. Um, and then also, I, you know, I, I even, I had a client this last fall, we, we did three low one high and you know what I mean? It wasn't even back to back refeeds. And, yeah. and, you know, he, he came to me halfway through his prep and wasn't refeeding at all and, and had never during a prep. And I was like, all right, well, we can keep rolling with this as long as you're losing here or whatever. And, and, uh, then he hit a plateau and we, we adjusted, um, couple different times he didn't see loss i said all right like i know you you normally don't in implement refeeds but we we need you know what I mean? mm -hmm. like we need yeah. to try this because like your metabolism is clearly adapting pretty well here we we you know we need to throw some higher days in and went to didn't change weekly calories at all just went to three low one high and all of a sudden he started losing again and mm -hmm. you know, i was yeah that's what i was like huh like i didn't think a single refeed day could be you know what i mean like, yeah and, but yeah, it, it seemed to get things rolling again. So, uh, but yeah, some sort, I, some sort of high carb day or back to back high carb, you know, throughout the week, typically with, with most people, um, you know, maybe if it's someone general population who isn't going to really low levels of body fat, you know, the stage lean, um, or, you know, someone, you know, mini cutting in the off season or something, we, we wouldn't implement, you know, need necessarily mm -hmm. need to implement that. Um, but yeah, someone died in the stage lean, typically some sort of, up and down throughout the week is at least from my experience typically going to be better yeah i think i think even you know it it potentially has those physiological benefits but yeah. just the psychological yes. benefits of having that higher day for sure yeah yeah i mean my last prep I, I i had my high day on sunday and then i always train legs on on monday um and you know and so i'd have a high day on an off day on sunday go in on monday and train legs and um, usually in the morning, you know, right away. And so I had all those mm -hmm. carbs from the day before. And I, I remember just Sundays were the best. Like you just got to sit, sit around and eat, uh, you know, popcorn and, and, you know, I, I fit, I could fit in some air pop popcorn or some, you know, uh, I mean, by the end, I was just happy. I ate more, I could eat more potatoes. I didn't even really fit anything right. in. I was just like, it's like, Oh, I get more potatoes. <laughs> yeah. And is that something you found as well as like the, the closer you get to, stage or whatever, you kind of work in less of those yeah, junk foods and you kind of I, keep I, it bland. I think most people, most people end up, you know, you know, uh, you know, with maybe without even trying just due to hunger, it kind of happens. We're yeah. like, you know, in the off season, you know, my recommendation is similar to most people, you know, at least 80, 90% of your food should be nutrient dense food, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's, you know, what my diet's like now in the off season and, and probably even throughout the early stages of prep, it's probably maybe 90, 10 or something like that. But yeah, as someone gets closer to stage lean, you, you start seeing more like, uh, you know, 95, five, 98 to, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it starts, um, you know, and it, I mean, mine was basically a hundred zero by the end. Um, I, I am someone who has a pretty adaptive metabolism though. So I, the math doesn't always add up. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm someone who it's 4,000 or more a day in the off season. Um, used to be 5,000 or more when I was younger, but these days, you know, four ish or in the off season. And, um, by the end of prep, 140 grams of carbs, like 200 or 2000, like 2000 calories. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I, my food, my, my caloric intake at the end of my last prep was literally half of, um, you know, what it was, 
when I started prepping. Mm -hmm. I mean, even recently here, I did a cut where I, I dropped from what 196 down to like 183. So like a I dropped like 13 pounds in like 12 weeks or something like that mm -hmm. here, like over the summer. Um, and you know, I was up around 4,000 at the start of that. And by the end I had to be at 2,600 oh, wow. uh, just to get that far. You know, like yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm someone who it, it's swing, you know what I mean? Like, but I'm also mm -hmm. someone then after a show, my calories got to go up fast because I won't gain, yeah. um, you know, until, you know, until you get my food higher. Um, so it's, it's gotta be a pretty aggressive shot out of a show too. Mm -hmm. So, it, I mean, everyone's a little bit different, you know, I've, I've worked with, you know, I'm, I'm on one end of the spectrum. I've worked with, I have a client who can only eat about 25, 2600 calories a day that I've prepped multiple times, a male client that's his off season. You set him at like 1900, 2000 a day. And it's like clockwork until he's within five or 10 pounds of stage lean. Like there's no plateaus that just, it's just, you know what I mean? There's Super no consistent, adaptation. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't adapt either direction. Like it's just, you know, it, it, you know, until he's extremely lean. So it's, it's crazy how much people can differ in that. Mm -hmm. So have you pretty much found that in the off season, if you tend to like gain on a consistent lower intake that usually when you diet, you can kind of diet on a consistently I don't want to say consistently <laughs> higher intake, but you yeah. don't necessarily have to keep adjusting down. Yeah, I think it depends on the person, um, you know, because I, I've had female client. I, I had a female client diet on without going below and a female client who was 120 pounds in her 40s. Uh, diet down to stage lean uh, at she was over 2,000 calories a day with basically little wow. no cardio. Um, you know what I mean? And, and mm -hmm. she was eating she was eating like th close to three in the off season. You know what I mean? So that's high, pretty high throughout. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I've had guys, yeah, who um, you know, I'm trying to think. I mean, I, I had a guy who was 130 some pounds on stage. I have to get down to like 1400 a day, but for a 130 pound guy, that's still over 10 calories per pound. Like that's not. Mm -hmm. It's just he's tiny. Like that's you know, they like, got tiny. I mean, he still won a show, but you know, he's, yeah. he's you know just small frame, you know, short, smaller stature, you know, and so um, you know, so it really, you know, it de depends on the person. You know, I, it's really interesting how different people can be and where they have to go. Yeah, for sure. And is there like a, a certain number that you don't really want to take people under? Like if you yeah. got to this number, would you kind of want to work their calories back up and kind of refresh a little bit or what would you do there? Yeah. I mean, if someone is starting to get someone who's not, um, someone who's not overweight or obese and they're starting to get down like 10, nine calories per pound. Um, you know, if we're getting down in that ballpark, so, you know, you have, you know, I don't know, 180 pound guy who's down to like 1600 a day. That's where I'm like, ah, we really want to probably not push further if we can av absolutely avoid it. Um, mm -hmm. you know, are, you know, are you at the end of prep, you know, how close are you to your show? How long would we have to push to this point? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it, it, that's, that's a lot of, you know, yeah, a lot of times, I, you know, those are things that I, I, you know, you know, things we typically think about. And really when we start getting down there too, it's, it's, can you actually be consistent with this? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because it is amazing how, you know, if you look at the scientific literature, how terrible people are at, at, as a whole at, S, or at, at, you know, measuring caloric intake. I mean, they, they've done studies in overweight and obese women where they underestimate, you know, metabolic ward studies where they're like underestimating intake by like a thousand calories a day. And, you know, there was, you know, this study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, you know, back in the 90s where they, the women who weren't losing weight, you know, eating you know, thinking they're eating less than 1200 calories a day and they're really eating like almost 2100 calories a day, you know, when they actually brought them in and measured everything. So there wasn't anything abnormal about them. Um, but you even see that in like trained dietitians are still off. I, I believe there's a study that showed they're off by two, 300 calories a day, you know, and, and someone deep in prep, that's enough to, you know, you know, yeah. pretty margin of error deep in prep. So, um, so yeah, that's one place I, a lot of times would look. And, and so there's a lot of other issues, you know what I mean? Issues I would mm -hmm. look at if, someone wasn't losing that low. Um, if they're really close to stage lean, sometimes that you have to go there, you know, but, um, you know, it's something I would try to avoid doing long-term and, you know, especially if someone wasn't dieting for a show, you know, and they had a significant amount of weight to lose, there's, there's no way like, you know what I mean? That yeah. now if they're overweight or obese, that, that number goes out the window. Cause you know, right. the pound is 
skewed, but, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, you know, if someone, you know, if someone, if a guy told me, ah, I got to go down to, you know, if 200 pound guy said, Oh, I got to go down to like, I don't know, 1500 calories a day to see weight loss. I'd be like, yeah, something's not right here. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And then if, if they are at that point and say they don't have like a deadline, they don't have a competition or anything like that. Would you then kind of bring them back up to maintenance and try to work their yeah. calories up a little bit or? Yeah, I think I would, I would probably look at a few things, you know, one, I, we got to make sure everything's tracked, right? That's the first, the first you know, um, yeah. second thing, make sure, even though it's more rare, second thing is make sure there's nothing medically going on. Um, you know, there it's, you know, rare, but there are medical reasons why people may not be mm-hmm. losing weight. Um, they're less common than what people think, but they, there are people, you know, I, I have clients who have like diagnosed thyroid disorders and things like that, you know, who have real reasons they may not see loss. Mm-hmm. Um, once they're medicated and they work with their doctor, you know what I mean? They, they can, yeah. um, but you know, that's, I'm not a medical doctor. That's where I'm like, go talk to your, your doctor. Yep. Um, that's not my area. Uh, and, um, uh, and so, you know, those things I'd, and then also I'd look at, you know, how long you, have you been dieting? How much further do we have to go? You know, if mm-hmm. you've been dieting a while and we still have a ways to go, yeah, going back up is, is, you know, um, yeah. and, and also how consistent have you been? You know, if, if you mm-hmm. haven't been able to stay consistent here, why would we push further? You know, yeah. let's, let's get, work your intake back up. Let's sit at maintenance for a while. See if we can you know, let hormone levels, metabolic rate kind of stabilize back out. Let's mm-hmm. and maybe you still have to push after that. Maybe, maybe not, you know, cause I, I've seen that where some people, you bring them out of a deficit for a while and the next cut goes, you know, then they drop back down, it goes smoother, but other people, you bring them out of a deficit for a while. It doesn't seem to matter. Like it has to be hard every time. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I have a client who I've prepped a couple of times. Um, I can, we can get her up to 18, 1900 calories a day in the off season with very little to no cardio, um, which is great for a smaller female. Um, mm-hmm. but it's 11, 1200 a day when prep starts every time, you know, because that we we've tried multiple times to get away with more than that. It just doesn't, you know what I mean? Happen. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So I think the, the next thing I kind of want to transition to is, you know, you, you touched on it a little bit there with talking about hormone levels kind of being shot a little bit. So kind of what are the reasons why people just tend to feel pretty dang crappy when they get to those lean, pretty lean stages? Yeah. I mean, I think there's probably a few reasons, you know, I, the hormone level, absolutely, you know, hormone levels are definitely off. So you're going to have, um, you know, decreased testosterone, decreased thyroid hormone, uh, hunger hormones are going to be off. So hormones that make you feel full or low hormones that make you feel hungry or high. Um, and that, that's really weird because like, you know, I, anyone who's been there can probably relate to this where you can like, you go out to eat after your show, you eat till you're physically full and you still have a drive to keep eating more, you know, like those hormones are so off that that full signal just doesn't Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Doesn't yeah. come. So I mean, it, 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 it's why people struggle so much with binging post show, and you see, you know, people balloon back up to where they were, or if not higher, you know, very quickly after a show, mm-hmm. um, which I don't think is a great idea either. But um, you know, but uh, you know, so hormone levels, absolutely. Um, you know, on top of that, low energy, really availability. You know, intake. And you also don't have much for energy stores. So, you know, mm-hmm. you're, you're going to be, um, and then, you know, psychologically that all can take a toll on you also, um, you know, you, having to be so regimented, being so run down still having to try to balance life. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy. And so, yeah, you, you don't feel great. Um, <laughs> typically when you're that lean, I always have to, you know, I, I always have to laugh when, when someone sends me, you know, I, cause I work with, you know, a quarter to my a third of my clients at this point are don't compete and have no interest in competing in bodybuilding mm-hmm. or lifting or anything like that. And I always have to laugh when I get an inquiry from, you know, someone who's not had no interest in competing, but they want to look like they compete. And I'm, you know, I, I <laughs> you know, I, during our initial call, I try to make it very clear to them. No, you, you don't, you know, like someone who looks like they compete, their goal is to then gain weight back. You know, your goal is to actually get somewhere you can sustain, which is, you know, for most people, 10, 15 pounds, you know, something like that above, you know, 20 pounds above, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or what someone is on stage. Like you, you don't <laughs> want to look like you can, you know, you're stepping on stage, yep. you know, um, th- th- there's no benefit to that. <laughs> and what's kind of your strategy 
after a dieting phase? Are you are you more so right up to maintenance calories? Are you a little slower with it? What what kind of do you do there? Depends on where what the cut got them to. Um, yeah. You know, if, if the cut got them to stage lean, they need to gain weight. There's there is no reason to stay stage lean. Um, if they are you know, like my cut coming, you know, I dropped, you know, 13 pounds in 12 weeks and the bottom end of my cut was still 20 pounds or more above stage. Like I am completely in a livable place. You can bring them up a little bit slower and you know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. and you yeah. know, we're not shooting for gain. I mean, you still want an initial pretty decent bump initially and get you closer to maintenance and, you know, work up from there. But, um, you know, I'm only shooting for a really slow gain at this point, you know, just a slow mm-hmm. upward drift. And I'm, I didn't immediately need to gain, you know, I, I was at a livable place where I felt good. Right. And, um, and so, but yeah, coming out of a show, absolutely. Um, I usually, I will bump, be pretty aggressive, um, you know, a bump intake of, you know, probably 20% to calorie, you know what I mean? Something mm-hmm. like that, 15, 20% of calories, cut cardio in half. Uh, even drops, I, I have clients track steps during prep, so, um, but drop step counts too. Um, and so, you know, to get them gaining and usually I'll, I'll say, all right, well, you know, eat whatever, you know, Saturday night, Sunday, as long as you're not just all out binging, you know, enjoy yeah. some stuff, come back Monday morning, you know, you might be up a little bit. That's fine. Start these new numbers. If by Wednesday they aren't, you know, their weight isn't at least staying the same or going up. Mm-hmm more food, you know, and I, I have them check in like every couple of days, you know, and, and just, just aggressively, usually a couple aggressive jumps and we can get them gaining. Yeah. Um, because, you know, my goal is typically for someone to gain probably one to two pounds a week, you know, coming out of their show until they get mm-hmm. back to a point where they're feeling normal, you know, and, and for some people that might be, you know, four weeks or some people that might be like eight, 10 weeks, you know what I mean? But there's kind of that bottom end of normal. So like, you know, I know for myself within, the first three months after my show, I had gained 20 pounds back. Um, and, and was that, you know, I was feeling pretty good again. And obviously from there rate of gain needs to slow, or you're going to be like 60 pounds over stage weight. I, I've done that before too. Um, I, I, you know, I, uh, I went from 145 to 210 after within a year and a half after my first show. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> and, and then when I dieted back down, I, I did probably just cause I was so new to lifting. I, I netted about 10 pounds. I was one or 11 pounds. I was 156. The next time I competed probably cause I was still, even the second time I dieted down for shows, I'd only been lifting really seriously for four and a half years by that point. Oh, wow. So you know what I mean? So like, yeah. you know, like that off season was like year two to year four and a half. So even though I gained 65 pounds, you know, I was able to net about 11, but, um, <laughs> Then the next off season, I only got up to 190 and I competed like five, six pounds heavier because I didn't diet off as much muscle, mm-hmm. dropped 60 pounds, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And what's kind of your experience with, you kind of mentioned in there that for some people, it takes just a few weeks to kind of feel good again after a diet, but some people it takes a long time. Yeah. What's kind of your experience with how long it takes to start feeling normal again after a diet? Yeah, I, I would say it, it could be probably one to three months as long as you're adding food back. Um, you know, if you don't add food back and add weight back, you can prolong that longer. Um, I don't care how high you get your food. If you're walking around with striated glutes, you probably don't feel great. Yeah. Um, you know, and so you, you got to gain some weight back after your show. You can't stay that lean. Um, and so I think it depends on a few things, too, uh, you know, where that point is. So for some people... Um, you know, if you compete, for example, in bikini, you don't need to be as lean as a bodybuilder. If you were, you know, stride of glutes lean, you wouldn't do well, you know, because I mean, I understand they're going leaner in bikini these days, but they're not going that lean, you know, like the lines in your glutes is still too lean. Um, and so, you know, your body fat percentage is higher on stage. Well, higher. I mean, it's still super low, but it's yeah. higher on stage than like a bodybuilder who has lines in their glutes. And so, you know, the distance from where you have to be on stage to a point that is actually doable, livable, um, is going to be closer than a bodybuilder, um, you know, is going to be who has to have, who gets all the way lean. You know, that's also another uh, caveat is, are you lean enough for your division? You know, um, you, you see that oftentimes someone diets down for their first show and they don't get lean enough and they may actually not be all that far off a place they can actually live but they still treat the post-show period like they are, you know, yeah. like they, they were lean enough and they, you know, so, all right. So you, you started prep 40 pounds over, you get on stage, maybe 10, 15 over, 
maybe you can live at 15, 20 over. Like maybe that's actually a livable place for you. Yeah. You don't need to gain 20 pounds back then. You probably don't need to gain a whole lot back. And by not doing that, you may actually help set yourself up for your next prep rather than gaining all the weight back. And, you know, Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so those would be things to consider. And then also, you know, we all differ in terms of, you know, kind of a genetic body fat kind of range that we can comfortably live in. You know, some people can live a little bit leaner than others. Um, so, you know, if someone competes in bikini, they, you know, maybe they could have lost a little bit more. Uh, they, uh, you know, have a pretty lean, that doesn't really probably wouldn't be a good scenario, but if someone, someone competes in bikini and they have a very, very lean, um, you know, place where they can sit kind of settling point, it might not take very long to add intake, you know, add food back. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, or to get, you know, add weight back to get to the point where they're feeling good again. You know, somebody who needs some bodybuilding who maybe, you know, a comfortable point for them is 25 pounds over stage weight, which, you know, for striated glutes, lean 25 over is actually not really all, you know what I mean? If, if they yeah. were absolutely diced, like 25 over that actually isn't overweight or, you know, I mean, it isn't. Yeah, especially it, considering like water weight and stuff like that. Too. Yeah, it's not as, you know, crazy, you know, over as you think, you know, so there are people where 25, 30 is where they kind of need to sit. And so for someone like that, like if you don't feel good until you're 20, 25 over, it might take a few months to, you know, a couple months. And, and even for them, you, depending on the length of their off season, they may, knowing that may want to be even more aggressive coming out and gain a little bit quicker. Um, you know, it's, it's all about, I always try to find that middle ground because you need to gain but you don't want to binge. Binging's not going to set you up for anything. Yes. Um, because, you know, if, you know, the goal, my goal is someone to gain quickly to kind of that bottom end of that range where they can actually live. Because then from there, you can just slow down rate of gain and you can just slow upward drift for a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you don't want to cut anytime soon after a show. Yeah. Um, you know, you were just in a deficit for how many months? Like, um, you know, so if we can get you back to feeling normal within a couple months and then just slow drift for a while, you know, no deficit, you know, um, but yeah, at some point, you know, so yeah, the goal is, you know, get them back up to feeling normal within a couple months and then slow upward drift, because if you can slow upward, you know, drift for a while, um, at some point you're going to need to cut, you know, you're, mm-hmm. you're either going to not be able to upward drift further, or you're going to, um, you know, you're going to have, you're going to get fairly high above, you know, body, you know, yeah. above stage. Um, you know, when someone binges out of a show and they get all the way back up to where they were at the top of their off season, you know, 30, 35 pounds over stage, mm-hmm. where do you go then? You know, you can sit there, but I mean, recomping in someone who's natural and who's trained for a while, it's not really going to happen to a large extent, you mm-hmm. know, maybe a little bit, um, you know, you know what I mean? Like it, it's, yeah. you're not, any drastic changes there you don't want to cut because you just cut and that's a mistake a lot of people make is they mm-hmm. binge and they cut again um that that just digs you a deeper hole and uh you don't want to keep gaining you know what i mean so you, yeah you kind of like you're kind of at this place where you kind of just have to chill there for a while hope for the best um you know hope you can see some recap and and hopefully at some point you can um you know hopefully at some point you can get back to a place where you can and successfully. So if, if you did get to that point to where you, you binged post-show and you got up to a much higher body fat than that you wanted to like peak off season levels, would your approach just be to kind of hang out there and just kind of wait until you feel normal again and then kind of yeah. cut, cut back a little bit or? Yeah. I mean, I, I would hang out there for a while because, you know, if you binge and within two weeks, you're 30 pounds above stage and that's higher than you want to be. And you try to cut again, Cutting's still going to be pretty much, in my experience, you know, you might drop some of the water, you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. there's some water and, 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 you know, things like that, that'll drop pretty quickly, but like to really see loss after the initial water drop, it's, it still pretty much takes what it took when you were dieting down to stage lean, you know, even though you're heavier now, because you, you, yeah, your food's been higher. Yeah. Your body fat's higher, but it hasn't been there for very long. Like things Mm -hmm. haven't normalized yet, you know, and that takes time. Um, you know, I, I think in some of the case studies where they've monitored people post show, um, it's it's taken five six months. Um, I had a client actually, uh, men's physique competitor, uh, a couple of years ago, take hormone levels. I think it was monthly after a show, just just for his own knowledge. And 
gaining, he gained weight back. And I think by two or three months back, he felt normal. He was back up, you know, 20 pounds or more over stage. You know what I mean? Like we, we had, we were aggressive coming out. Um, and even though he was back up there, I still took, I believe it was still four or five months after that hormone wow. levels were actually back to where they were pre-contest. And so, um, yeah, I, just cause he got there didn't mean they were immediately there, you know, which was, you know, kind of what you see in the literature too. Um, uh, and so it, it takes time. And so, uh, even, you know, even for someone being aggressive coming out. So, yeah, cutting, that's, that is the worst thing you can do is cutting after, you know, shortly after cutting. And I've had, yeah. I've, you know, and so I typically don't, for that reason, I typically don't prep people for like spring and then fall. Like, you know, we all, I think we all know the people where you, you, you go to enough shows, you see the same people do, you know, they compete in the spring when the shows start. You see them at shows throughout the year. The only reason they stop competing in the fall is because shows are done. Um, you know, like there aren't yeah. any shows here from, th- you know, in the Midwest, really drug tested shows from Thanksgiving till about April. Um, and then they start up right, right away again. And I typically, you know, I, I'm a fan of diet, get lean, do n- multiple shows in a couple month period while you're lean and stop being that lean, mm-hmm. you know, again, some yeah. way back. Um, and so there's been a couple times where I've had to prep people for spring and then fall. Typically it's something where like, they won or they qualified for something and what they qualified in the spring, what they qualified for was in the fall and only good for that year. You know, some like a situation like that where mm-hmm. we had to do spring fall. And so in that case, it's really hard because you have to like half gain weight back. Like, cause there's, you, you know, if you have six months between shows, you have to, you know, you're not making any progress. The goal is just to get back to that lean and not go back. Yeah. And so, you know, you gain enough weight back that as much as you can while still having time to go back down and even doing that, you know, if you spend three months gaining, you gain about 10 pounds back, you know, and then, you know, you cut for the other three months. Um, Even doing that every time I've done that, basically, the second cut has been harder. Um, You know, it, it, it really, if you can take at least a year between shows, it can make such a huge difference, you know, just you know, more time out of a deficit, you know, I, I, that's kind of the general rule of thumb. I always throw out there is be out of a deficit. If you graph out and I've done this, you know, graph out your entire career training, um, more time should be spent out of a deficit than in one. Like if, if more is spent in a deficit, you're probably going about it, you know, wrong. You know, you, you should be out of a deficit more than in one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. And kind of, what are you looking for to decide what's a livable place for somebody? Is it just kind of based on how, how they're feeling, their feedback they're yeah. giving you? Or? Yeah, I mean, you know, for some clients, they'll actually go get hormone panels done, which, which helps. But it's interesting because they, you know, they, like I said, weight can go back up before those normalize. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, yeah, feel, a lot of it's feel, you know, strength should be back up in the gym. You know, they're, you know we, we all know the feeling after a show when you've gained enough weight that things start clicking again mm-hmm. in the gym. You actually start feeling, you know, workouts don't suck anymore and they actually start feeling good. Um, you know, so workout should be going good. Sleep should be better. You shouldn't be hungry all the time, thinking about food all the time as much. Um, you know, sex drive should be higher again. Um, that usually tanks, uh, during prep, mm-hmm. um, you know, all, all of those type of factors, you know, are, you know, mood should be better. Energy should be better. Um, you know, those are all things I would be considering, you know, you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't feel like you're having to be super restrictive to hold the weight you're at. You know, if you're, if you're holding a weight that's lower than where you should probably sit in the off season, you know, like if I tried to hold five or seven pounds above stage weight, I could probably do it. I wouldn't feel great. And it probably would take a lot of restriction and restraint. Um, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like in the off season, like I would be, I would have to, you know, almost treat it like prep levels of restraint and restriction to be able to, to stay there. Um, and that, obviously psychological health, but I mean, um, long-term like on your next prep, because if you feel like your whole off season is super restrictive, when it comes time to diet down again, you're, you, you know, and you have to actually go there because it's been so restrictive for so long, like that, you can only do that for a finite mm-hmm. of, you know, amount of time. So by, and I'm not saying just free for all eat, whatever. I mean, I, I still track macros throughout the off season and it's just, my food's higher. I don't feel super restricted, you know, like there, it doesn't take a lot of restraint to keep my weight where it's at. Um, so when it comes time to diet, all right, I can tighten things up. You know, I'm, I'm not feeling, you know, like burdened by it right now. And, and so yeah. I, I'm having that break. Um, and I think that's something a lot of people forget also. Mm-hmm. And 
I was I was going to ask you whether you tracked your macros throughout your offseason because that's something that seems like it's starting to get like starting to turn a little bit to where tracking yeah. macros is getting a little bit more of a bad rap to potentially yeah. leading to some and less just, favorable I, eating behavior. So what, yeah, what's kind of your opinion on, on that? I think it depends on the person. Um, so I, a lot of my clients don't track macros in the offseason. It, it comes down to what do you, you know, the thing I always, you know, ask clients, you know, how restrained, restricted do you feel by what you're doing? Because we need to do it. You need to do enough that you keep things in check in the off season. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like, you know, typically is, is my recommendation. You know, you don't want to just let it be a free for all. Like this is the time you're trying to make progress. Like you want to make sure you're eating enough food that, you know, you're, you're supporting muscle growth. You're not getting too far above stage lean, you know, but um, you know, and so the, it's an important time that can help you know, it's where your progress, this is where the progress happens is in the off mm-hmm. season. But at the same time, you, you don't want it. Like I was saying, you don't want to feel like you're being super restrained. Um, and so what that is may look different for different people. So in my case, you know, I, I track macros. It's not a big deal. My intake's really high. You know, I can ballpark some, you know, I can go out to eat ballpark it and it fits, you know, mm-hmm. um, it, it really isn't that big a deal um, for me. Um, I have other clients who track macros throughout the off season. They, they don't mind, um, you know, they don't feel restrained by it. Other people absolutely do. And so maybe they do things like, um, you know, a wider macro range, you know, where, okay, we're not trying to hit plus or minus five anymore. Maybe we're falling in a 40, 50 gram, you know, range, you yeah. know what I mean? Like oh, something wide, um, you know, other, a lot of my clients actually just worry about calories, protein, you know, and, and maybe we, uh, maybe we throw a fruit and vegetable minimum in there. Um, and that protein might be a minimum in terms of grams or just servings. You know, maybe mm-hmm. it's fall in this calorie range each day, eat at least this many servings of protein, this many servings of yeah. fruit, this many servings of vegetables. Um, you know what I mean? It could be something as loose as that, you know, just keeping things in the ballpark, you know. And and I know there are people who do more intuitive approaches in the off season too. And as, as long as you can keep that in check, that's, you know, there's nothing wrong with there's yeah. nothing wrong with any of those approaches as long as, you know, as, as long as you can keep things in check, you know, in the off season doing what you're doing, you know, and it, it sets you up, you know, to be making progress. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum that you don't feel so restrained that your entire year feels just, you know what I mean? Just absolutely restricted, restrained. Yeah. Uh, and like you, you know, like it, it shouldn't all feel as restrictive as prep. You know, if, mm-hmm. if it does, you might want to loosen up your tracking approach a little bit in the off season. Yeah. So, so you really look at how restrained or restricted a client feels like it's making them and you yeah. kind of adjust your, yeah, your guidelines it, off that. Yeah. The combination of that and, and, you know, and then what happens when you loosen that, like when you, yeah. you know, is, is this actually a realistic thing based on you, you know, you're, you know, you know, and, um, it may or may not be, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. you know, I've had a lot of clients just look at, you know what I mean? Do looser approaches and be totally fine. Um, yeah. you know, I, I've had clients move to intuitive approaches at times and be totally fine. You know, some people can't do that. Um, some people think after their show, they're going to move to an intuitive approach. And <laughs> honestly, that's the worst time to do it. Intuitive, intuitive eating means that you are actually paying attention to normal physiological hunger, full signals. I could probably, you know, I, I shouldn't say that I probably would lose weight if I did that in the off season, but, um, you know, and I wouldn't get stage lean if I, you know, did that during prep, you know? And so, but anyways, um, but for most, you know, people in the off season, if you're sitting at a comfortable body fat, you know, there, there are people who absolutely can do that, you know? Uh, but if you're stage lean, hunger hormones aren't normal, you know, that's, that's not a time to be paying attention to, you know, that's where, like we, we talked about earlier, that's where you get the situation where you eat a bunch of food, you physiologically feel full, like your stomach is distended, but you still have that drive to eat. Like you're, you're, you can't trust your intuition at, at stage mm-hmm. lean. Like you, you got it. You know, I, even someone who's going to a looser tracking approach, I would, you know, or going more intuitive approach, I would still track something, you know, calories or something coming out of your show to keep yourself in check and, and try to gradually work your way to that once you do feel more normal and once you're not constantly hungry all the time. Um, because all paying attention to your intuition is going to do after a show is just lead you to binging because yep. you're, you're just hungry. It, it doesn't matter how much food's in your stomach. You'll just keep eating. Yep, for sure. When, <laughs> when everything's out of whack, that is not a great no. time to just free the raids, you know? No, not, not at all. That, that will end badly. (laughs) For sure. So the very last thing that I kind of want to ask you, and this might be somewhat of a difficult question to answer, but 
you know, I've, I really don't plan on competing, but I'm just interested in kind of what's it, what's it like to step out on that stage, to have the lights on you, to go through your posing routine. What's that kind of feel like? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a blast. I mean, I, I, uh, I remember back in my first show, I, I, I did terrible. Like I, uh, you know, I, I don't understand, you know, like I, it was still awesome though. Like I, I, t- you know, I, I got to hang out, hang out with all these guys, met all these guys who had like similar interests to me throughout the, you know, the day and stuff. And, um, you know, we all work towards a common goal and, and, uh, you know, at my first show, like I took pretty much last in everything. Like I was only 145 pounds. I was 18 years old. I hadn't been lifting long enough to have enough muscle to be com- remotely competitive. Um, I'm even a smaller guy now. Like I, you know, I, I, it's argued, you know, like, um, and, and, uh, you know, back then I was really small. And so, um, you know, it, it yeah. So I, but it, it was a blast. I mean, you know, I think, and I was hooked. I mean, I, I've dieted down five times to stage lean now since 2004, um, and done 10 shows. Um, and so, you know, usually multiple a year when I get lean, um, you know, it, yeah, it, I, I think my favorite th- you know, thing about shows now is I've, maybe it's cause I've accomplished more and, you know, I've realized that I really, the placings are what they are. I, I put less emphasis on that these days and more on just looking as crazy as I possibly can and, you know, let the chips fall where they may. Um, you know, when I was newer to competing, it was, you know, it's all about placing and winning and whatever, you know, whatever, but, um, don't get me wrong. I, I still want to win, but I, I, I'll look as crazy as possible and, and we'll see what happens. But the, the thing I really enjoy is, you know, especially now that I, I'm a pro, you go to some of these shows and you actually know who a lot of the other guys are you're competing against. Um, I, my last show was in Peoria in 2016. Um, and, uh, there were eight pros. I knew, I believe five of the other guys, uh, ahead of time. Like I knew who they were. We'd compete against each other, ran into each other over the, you know what I mean? Like we all knew each other. And so we all just like hung out throughout the day. Like, you know what I mean? Like it yeah. was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like we walked around that curtain, like to line up and it was just like, dead silence like it was on like you know we went from like joking and hanging out to like it it game time and i mean we were on stage for i mean probably at least 20 minutes it was it was a really long prejudging i got moved pretty much every i had no idea where i placed i ended up fourth but i was literally every pretty much spot possible on stage i got moved all over the place and um it was it was awesome like you know it it was a lot of fun just to hang out and, and you know with those guys all day like that 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 to me is a lot of fun you know and and uh i mean not that you have to compete to find people with similar interests but it it is it, there's something to be said about showing up on show day and having you know all these people that kind of went through everything you've gone through during prep and you know and you get to kind of show it yeah so your kind of favorite things kind of that community aspect yeah, that bond yeah. that you have with them yeah because i mean bodybuilding is a really like you know it can be an isolating sport like you yeah. you you prep your food you eat your meals you know you you know you go do your workouts and stuff and mm-hmm. you know i live in the middle of nowhere there's nobody else other than my wife there's nobody else at my gym that really competes like yeah. Yeah. um you know there's there's a gym about a half hour away that i have a membership at where i can you know there's some guys that compete but i can't get there every day so yeah. I mean, I, I did, other than, you know, emailing back and forth and Skyping with clients, I don't really talk, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, you don't have a lot of interaction like in person with, with, you know, people with similar goals. So I, it's a lot of fun. I mean, I, I always enjoy going to shows mm-hmm. and I, I, I travel to a lot of them in the Midwest, just, you know, now that this is my full-time job because I, I like it. It's, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That, that definitely makes, makes me want to consider competing more for sure. Yeah. So yeah, everyone's everyone's super nice backs. Like everyone in my experience has been really nice. Like they're they're very the bad apples are few and far between. It's mm-hmm. it's not at least at the drug tested shows. I've heard some horror stories on the other side, but um, you know, I, I haven't ever competed untested, so I can't really comment. But right. um but yeah, in my experience, everyone's been really cool. Um and yeah, it's it's not all catty and whatnot. Uh, that, that is what I've heard from like almost everybody I've talked to that's competed. They're like the, the some of the nicest people you're going to meet are yeah. at shows and stuff. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I was backstage at IP worlds this year. One of my clients competed there and the pro bodybuilding class there was nuts. And 
everyone was just kind of hanging out, like, you mm-hmm. know, backstage. It was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I was just there as a coach. Like I wasn't competing, but like everyone was super nice. And I'm like, man, like, you know, I, I'm there as a coach. And I mean, every single one of these guys had a physique better than me, you know, like if I was, even if I was dying down and competing, but it was yeah. really, you know, like it didn't matter. Like everyone was just really cool hanging out, you know, and, um, it was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I kind of missed that, that kind of locker room vi- vibe from high school sports and stuff. Yeah. So I think that'd yeah. be kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, where can people find more about you and find your stuff and things like that? Yeah. So, um, my website, fitbodyphysique.com, um, Instagram at fitbodyphysique. I'm on Facebook. Um, you can always email me fitbodyphysique at gmail.com. Uh, I also have a book coming out in the spring, um, with Cliff Wilson. Um, yeah, it's going to be published by human kinetics. I can actually legally talk about it now. Um, (laughs) so, um, but yeah, it's, uh, called, uh, bodybuilding, the complete contest prep handbook. Um, so coming out, I believe they have it scheduled for April release. Um, I, you know, it's written, um, over 75,000 words at this point, done, edited. Um, yeah, Cliff and I put a lot of time into it. it. There's a lot of stuff in there. So we just wrapped up picture collection. So we got pictures of a lot of like stage shots of a lot of high level natural pros and some, cool. even a couple of IFBB pros in there. And, um, yeah, it, it's, I, I'm pretty pumped. It's been a long time coming. So I'm yeah, pretty yeah. excited to get it out there. Yeah. I think that'll be a fantastic resource for people. There's really not that many like bodybuilding resources out there. So that should be great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I don't know how we managed to, it, I'm just pumped. We got, I mean, human kinetics publishes all the stuff, uh, for the national strength and conditioning association. So like for the CSCS certification. Um, and so, uh, I, I believe that from the sounds of it, they're going to make a continuing ed course, even like out of our book and stuff with, for cool. like CSCS, like CUs and stuff, which yeah. is really cool. So, um, yeah, I'm pretty pumped. Yeah. That's awesome. So is that, that's human kinetics. That sounds like a, a book publisher that I've bought a lot of textbooks for yes. my master's yeah. degree and stuff. Yeah. So like, um, the la- I, I rec- like Brad Schoenfeld's recent book, like from a couple of years ago, um, like science of muscle hypertrophy or, you know, whatever, it was, yep. you know, something yep. like that was called. Um, they published that. Um, so he Lee's books, they publish, um, they, you know what I mean? They publish a lot of the, yeah, they, their niche is is this stuff, and so uh-huh. you know, exercise and type textbooks, and so yeah, you you've probably like the the essentials of strength and conditioning research, the CSCS you know prep book is theirs, you know, yep. publish that. Um, so yeah, it, it we fit right in with what they're doing, and so we're really happy to you know, Cliff and I we prep people for a full time job. We we don't know how to do all of this stuff to act, you know what I mean? To, yeah all of the behind the scenes stuff involved in putting a book together and making it look good and, you know, mm-hmm. the printing and the, I don't know the, all the, you know, marketing and all the getting it on Amazon. And I, yeah. I, I, we could probably figure it out, but I don't know that either of us have the time to do it. So we're really glad to have them on board to mm-hmm. take care of those things for us. Yeah, for sure. Well, when it comes out, make sure to send me an email and I will definitely help you try to get the word out for it. For sure. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, no, we are, we are pumped. We're, we're looking forward to it. So hopefully we'll have more info on like pre-order and stuff soon. So cool. Well, I think that's all the time we have today. So thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for tuning in the podcast. Make sure to go check out Peter Fitchin's stuff. Make sure to check out my stuff at ryanjsalva.com if you're interested in coaching, anything like that. And I will see you in that next one.